We're, uh, we're in a series, and I know you guys that have been here every, every Sunday have recognized this, that we're in a series on uh, the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are simply uh, attitudes that we're supposed to be. Uh, these are attitudes that Jesus had. And Jesus said, all right, you, if you want to be happy in life, uh, here's the attitude you have to have. We all are searching for happiness, right? Is there anybody in the building that doesn't want to be happy? You say, man, I want to be miserable. I, I've been looking forward to being miserable my whole life, and I certainly don't want to do anything that will make me happy. No. <laughs> if you are, come on down here to the altar because you got a spirit of lying on you, and you need to be praying. <laughs> you need to be prayed. That needs to be prayed off of you right now. Uh, right now, absolutely right now. No, we, we all want to be happy, and Jesus knew that, and that's why... He started the greatest sermon uh, that he ever preached, according to most theologians and people that, uh, that love Jesus and follow what he did and said in the New Testament. This, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, are, is the greatest message that Jesus ever preached. It, it's about the kingdom of God, and it's about the principles that operate and function in the kingdom of God. By the way, the kingdom of God is not somewhere in la-la land. The kingdom of God is right here, right now, as the Holy Spirit is in our life, and we, there is a spiritual world around us. And what happens in this physical world is simply a reflection of what's going on in the spiritual world. The spiritual world is the true world. It's the, it's the world that controls the things around us, and, and the kingdom of God is where all of us who love the Lord from every denomination, from every group, from every where, if you love the Lord and your soul is saved and you walk with Christ and you receive Christ, whatever words you use to do that, you're in the kingdom of God and we're all in it together. And, and it not only is something that's going to come one day onto this earth physically, right now spiritually it's on this earth. And these are the principles that rule the kingdom of God. And the word blessed is the word markyrios, which simply can be translated just as easily, happy are you. So we've been looking at uh, the Beatitudes, and let's just look at them uh, right now. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. That just simply, Jesus is just simply saying, you're happy when you recognize your need for God. That's what poor in spirit means. It means I recognize that I need help, that I'm not the end of everything, that I'm not the greatest, that I can't provide for myself. In other words, poor in heart it deals with an attitude within you, the attitude of humility, the attitude of sacrifice within you that recognizes that there's something more needed than you can give. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not moan, but mourn. Legitimate grief is what it's talking about here. If you have legitimate grief in your life, and I know some of you do, right? You've lost loved ones. You've had tragedies. You, you've suffered through things. You may be right now in some kind of catastrophe or crisis or Life is challenging you in lots of ways, and you have legitimate grief. And Jesus said you can be happy when you have legitimate grief because God's going to come to you with strength. That's what comfort means. God's not going to just send you a little candy gram and say, thinking about you in hard times. No, God, God, God comes with strength. And so he comforts you when you have legitimate grief. Then happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek means strength under control. It means that I am able to control myself and not overpower other people. And this really deals with an attitude of other people in my life. So this is dealing with the fact that I can be happy if I, if I don't overreact to other people in my life that I don't blow them out of the water, that I don't intimidate them and scare them to death, that I don't violate them and, and, and argue and, and just overwhelm them with some kind of anger or hostility or, or intimidation. And you know, ha I, I can be happy if I can keep that under control and don't do that to other people because you really do reap what you sow. Yeah, that's exactly right. You sow in discord. You sow in dissension. You, you sow in a bad word. You sow in anger, hostility, sarcasm, and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what you're getting back? 
You are getting back exactly what you give out. And Jesus yeah. said, you can be happy if you can keep that mess under control in your life. Verse 6, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This means being hungry for the right thing. When you're hungry to be right with God, when you're thirsty to be right with God, uh, not this spiritual junk food that we yeah. usually try to fill ourselves up with. I mean, we're, we're, we're hungry for something that's legitimate, the rightness of God. That's what righteousness means. Righteousness just means I'm right with God. That's what it means. And God said, you can be happy when that's what you want because I can do something about that. I can feel you. I will give it to you. I will empower you. I'll strengthen you. I can do that. I'm going to fill you up because you're hungry for the right thing. But God's not going to feed you spiritual Twinkies and stuff now. I'm going to tell you that. That junk food doesn't cut it, right? Then happier are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What you get, what, I mean, what you give, you get. If you give mercy, you get mercy. If you don't give mercy, you don't get mercy. It's the law of direct return. That's what it is. And if you're merciful, you're going to obtain mercy in your life. Happy are the pure in heart, which was last week, for they shall see God. Pure in heart just means you don't have mixed up motives. It actually means happy is the person of unmixed motives. That just means I don't say one thing and live another. It means I don't preach one thing and do something else in life. It means I'm the same on the outside as I am on the inside. I'm the same on the inside as I am. I'm not mixed up. I'm not conflicted in my life. And I can be happy when my motives are pure and my motives are clean because I'm going to see God work in my life. Yeah. What, I, I guarantee you, if you've ever seen God work in your life, you have, you, you have never forgotten it, have you? I, right now, it's just as alive as it was the day or the moment it happened. And all we'd have to do is say, can you give us a testimony of what it was like? And you'd be enthusiastic and jump up and say, Pastor, it was unbelievable because I know God did this in my life. You saw God in what he did in your life. And that says when you are unmixed in your motives, you're going to be able to see God work in your own life. And that's going to make you happy. You're going to be blessed by that. And then today, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Wow. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, I'm always interested when people start talking about my children. Aren't you? Yeah, when they start talking about your children, don't you kind of listen a little more intently? It's always interesting to hear what they say about your children, especially when it comes to, like, who they look like, uh, uh, how, how they're, how they're, they, they're shaped. Uh, in other words, people, it's amazing what people do and what they say about Justin and Amy, our, our two children. Some people enthusiastically will come up to me and say, Pastor Boy, Justin looks just like you. Now, I know his hair is kind of doing what mine's doing. But this was, you know, when he had a lot of hair and nice and, you know, and, uh, and even then they would say, Pastor, he, some people would say, Pastor, he looks just like you. And then some people would just as enthusiastically say, Amy looks just like her mama. Now, we know the truth, don't we, right? <laughs> Justin looks like his mama and Amy looks like me. <laughs> bless, bless her heart, you know. <laughs> but but the, 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 the amazing thing is uh, about g genetics and, and all of that is how God blends these genetics and these, and, these, uh, and these recessive and dominant genes in our life so that we become and we look like what's looking back at us in the mirror, right? I mean, it's amazing. And usually we have parts of our life that look like both our mother and our father. We have genetics and dominant genes and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm just saying that because th this beatitude here is about children of God. And Jesus says in blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Jesus is saying that there's always one trait that we can have in life that will make us reflect the image of our father. You know, just like we reflect the image of our mother and father earthly by the way we look and the tendencies we have in life and so forth like that, Jesus said it's like that in the spiritual realm. 
You have a heavenly father. And if you want to look like your heavenly father, here's the one trait that you have to have in life. You have to be a peacemaker. When you are a peacemaker in life, you are reflecting the image of your father. And when people see you as a peacemaker, they're going to say, man, that's a chip off the old block because that he looks just like God. Now, it doesn't say happy are the peace lovers. Because I, I guarantee if I took a poll here today, I said, who loves peace? You would say, I love peace. I want to have peace. I don't, I don't want to be in turmoil. and I don't want to be anxious. I, I love peace and I want peace. But it doesn't say happy are the peace lovers. We all love peace and want peace. And it doesn't say happy are the peace above, which just means the people that uh, sit around and... Uh, don't do anything. The people that just kind of lull their way through life, the people that just kind of uh, hang out and, and don't get stirred up about anything. What does it say? It says, happy are the peacemakers, the people that actively seek to, re to reduce conflict in life. To make peace is, a, is, a, is an action. It's an activity and what it means is I'm actively doing something to promote peace in my world that I live in and that I'm around. So let's look at peace today just a moment. I know we're going to need to do this quickly. Let's look at a couple of misconceptions. And I know you probably have this in your notes. So you need a blank to be filled in. Uh, <laughs> the first one is... Uh, what is not, what peacemaking is not, and I just want to mention a couple of these because a lot of times people think this, peacemaking is not avoidance. Uh, peacemaking is not running from the problem is really what I'm saying. It, 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 it's not pretending that, that, the, that a problem doesn't exist. It's not just, uh, it, it's not just avoiding it and, and acting like, well, uh, this problem doesn't exist. Uh, have any of you ever been in a situation, especially, uh, you can notice it in your family probably more than anywhere else, like a family fight or some kind of dissension going on in your family, and, um, and, and you've, just, uh, uh, you've just stood back and, and said, oh, well, you know, I don't need to get involved. Uh, it, it, it'll go away. Let me ask you, does it ever go away? I mean, just by itself, does it really ever get better and go away? <laughs> well, not really. So that's not peacemaking. Peacemaking is not avoiding the fact that I need to get in there and do something. And then secondly, peacemaking is not appeasement. Appeasement means to give in, to let them have their way. It means to basically uh, passively become a doormat and let everybody run over you. That's what appeasement really means. Uh, you know, just let them get away with it. Go buy it. Uh, just don't, don't ruffle the waves and become a doormat to whoever in life wants to offend you and whatever they might want to do. Now, Jesus was probably one of the most criticized persons that ever lived on this earth. I mean, Jesus came into conflict with, with his environment in every way. Jesus was controversial, but Jesus never gave in and allowed others to treat him like a doormat. And he doesn't tell us to give in and let people treat us like a doormat. The Jews, the temple, the Sanhedrin, the Roman government, all of those uh, tried to control everything about Christ and, 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 tried to, and tried to overrun him, but Jesus didn't allow that to happen. And so Jesus never called us to be a doormat and give up our identity. So peacemaking is not avoidance. Peacemaking is not appeasement. What is peacemaking? It's actively seeking to resolve conflict in life. Now to do that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of effort to do that. It's a very tough process to be a peacemaker. So we're going to have to have some very strong motivators in order to make peace because it'll wear you out. Matter of fact, I heard one pastor quote uh, the, the beatitude, uh, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. He quoted it like this, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall have their eyes scratched out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know that's a little pessimistic, but 
That's probably, you know, the, the real world translation of that path. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall have their eyes. So, so why would I want to be a peacemaker then? I mean, I'm, I, I got to have something to motivate me that in spite of the fact that I'm probably going to get hammered in this thing and I'm probably going to get, uh, it, it's going to ruffle me up and it's a lot of trouble and a lot of effort for somebody else. Uh, why should I do this? Well, I'm going to share with you quickly three little motivators that I've found that help me push me toward this. Number one motivator, unresolved conflict blocks my fellowship with God. Yeah, in other words, if, 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 if I'm out of fellowship with someone, then I'm out of fellowship with God. Yeah, I, I, if, if, I, if I'm out of fellowship with, with you, let's just say, a Christian brother, then I'm going to avoid the presence of God. Why am I going to avoid the presence of God? Because when I get in his presence, I start feeling convicted, you know? And I don't want to feel convicted, so it blocks my fellowship because it makes me want to stay away from God rather than run to God. And, and also, it, it, it kind of hinders me from hearing the voice of God. So therefore, therefore, my fellowship with God is blocked because if I can't hear from him and I don't want to be in his presence, then that's a problem. Because my relationship to God is, is, is one thing, but my fellowship with God is what I desire more than anything. And the Bible says, I mean, do you know this? That the Bible says that you can't be out of fellowship with your fellow brother or sister in Christ is what the implication is. You can't be out of, at odds with your, with your Christian brother and, and not be at odds with God at the same time. I mean, that's, I know that's bad, sounds tough, sounds hard, but that's what it says. Now, there's one possible exception to this, and the possible exception is in Romans 12, Jesus said, if it is possible, everybody say, if it's possible. Yeah. All right, if it's possible, as much as it depends on you, that means Anything that you can do that will make it better, anything that is within your control to do to make, to make this thing come together and not be at odds, if it is possible, if's a big word, right? It means sometimes it might not be possible, right? It means sometimes they are not going to cooperate and some people are just basically unget alongable, you know? I mean, it's really, it's like, okay, if it's possible as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men, which means sometimes it's not up to you. Sometimes they won't let you live peaceably with them. Sometimes it's impossible because they keep violating the, the standards of what was decided and somehow, it, it, you know, they just will not allow you to live at peace with them. So we're not talking about those kind of specialized situations. We're talking just about the fact that we... We're humans. We can get bumped out of the saddle and angry at people and out of fellowship and have something in our heart that shouldn't be there, and it hinders our fellowship with God. First John 4, verse 20 and 21, look at what it says. If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, now this is his Christian brother. That's, that's not just talking about somebody out there in the world. It's talking about your Christian brother. If someone says, I love God, but hates his Christian brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So that's quite a, uh, that's quite a word from the Lord that we can't love God and, we, and, and be out of fellowship with our brother. It's just not possible. Now we're going to add 1 John 1 to the little thought here. And look what it says. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things we write to you that your joy might be full. What, what, what's the implication here? Those two together, one's talking about having fellowship with God and and being close to God, and this is talking about having fellowship with all of the rest of our brothers and sisters. And, 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 and when, we, when, when we have fellowship with God and fellowship with our brothers and sisters, our joy is going to be full. What is the implication of that? 
if we are not in fellowship with our brother and sister in Christ, and if we can't have fellowship with them legitimately, then we're not going to have full joy. And our joy is going to be incomplete. And that's going to that's gonna bring a certain element of, of heaviness and sadness in my life. The implication is, if I'm right with God, and my brother over here is right with God, and we got a little deal going on, then because he's right with God and I'm right with God, then we're grow, he's growing toward the Lord, I'm growing toward the Lord. The, the implication is that, that we're going to grow toward each other. You know, uh, Inevitably, we're going to grow toward each other. And so if I'm not in fellowship horizontally with my brother in Christ, then my vertical relationship is not going to be right, and, and therefore my joy is going to be limited. And who wants to live with limited joy? <laughs> I want all of it I can get, right? You do too? All right, here's a second reason, a second motivator. Uh, unresolved conflicts prevent answered prayers. I mean, that's a big motivator, right? How many of you want your prayers answered? Mm -hmm. How many of you don't want your prayer answered? I guess that would be a better question. Mm. Mm -mm. No, you want, you want God to answer your prayers. You want, you want an answer from the Lord. Well, uh, fellowship issues have something to do with your prayers being answered. I don't know if you're aware of this, but let me just read you, and, and let me just show you First Peter 3. This is one right up here, uh, husbands and wives. Look at what it says here. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. Everybody say, them is my wife. Uh, likewise, husband, uh, husband, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and that doesn't mean that she's less or inferior. It, it just has to do with physical strength. It means husbands are generally stronger than their wives. They're the biggest thing in the house. You know, they're the most intimidating thing in the house. They can do violence to things in the house. And it's saying, men, keep in mind that even though you can intimidate and dominate and control and hurt and harm and, and, and all of that, your wife, you better not do that because if you do that, uh, you're, you're going to violate the fact that you're both heirs together of the grace of life. That means the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no male or female at the foot of the cross. There's just saved sinners at the foot of the cross. So uh, uh, that your prayers uh, be not hindered. In other words, God says, you know, if your prayers aren't being answered, look at your relationship. How's your relationship being? Is it good? Well, no. Well, well no, all right. It's going to hinder your prayers. And then look here in Matthew, 25, Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there, there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, therefore, at the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So putting those together about my prayer being hindered if I can't be in fellowship with my wife, and if I'm intimidating and, 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 uh, and annoying and I, and I can't be at fellowship and, and, and treat her with respect as the one who's closest to me and then I'm out of fellowship with my brother and I, I'm trying to do something in spite of the fact that I'm out of fellowship. I mean, I'm out of fellowship, but I'm trying to bring my offering to the church. I'm out of fellowship, but I'm trying to stand up and sing. I, I, I'm out of fellowship, but I, but, but, but I, but I, I want to pray. You know, I, I want, That's what I can do. I, I'll just lead everybody in prayer, or I'll preach a sermon, or, or do something that will uh, satisfy God in spite of the fact that I'm out of fellowship with my brother. And these two passages and, 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 and bunch more says, look, nothing can substitute for reconciliation. Singing won't do it. Preaching won't do it. Praying won't do it. Teaching won't do it. Nothing can take the place of reconciliation in life. Oh, I know. I hear you praying in the spirit, but what about Susie? I mean, I see how spiritual you are and how mighty in faith you are, but, but what about Bobby? What, what about your relationship with your, with your fellow man? God said, nothing, uh, you can't pray enough, you can't preach enough, you can't sing enough, you can't substitute for this, is what it, it's really saying. And peacemakers always take the initiative. That's what a peacemaker is. Somebody that takes the initiative 
to step in there and say, bless God, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get this thing moved one direction or another because it's, it, it's hindering my prayers from being answered and, and my fellowship with God. I feel like I'm a long way. Here's the third uh, motivator. Unresolved conflicts hinders my happiness. Uh, uh, when, I'm out of con when, 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 I'm, when I'm out of fellowship with Tanya, wait a minute, I might better use another example because... You know, we don't, we don't ever get out of fellowship up there on Marshmallow Lane and Glory to God Avenue, right? <laughs> I mean, that's where we live, right? Nothing bad ever happens to us. You know, we live in this fantasy land of wonderful life, you know. No, no, you know we don't. But if, I, if, if I'm out of fellowship with her, my life's miserable. Well, I mean, she makes sure. <laughs> come on. I mean, come on, you know what I'm talking about, huh? <laughs> Come on, guys, help me out, help me out. You know, yeah, yeah, no, you better be quiet and just sit there. That's right. That, look straight ahead. This is not the time to look at your wife, all right? That's right. But, but look at Job, look at Job 18. We're talking about, okay, uh, if, I'm, if I'm in fellowship, I'm happy, and if I'm not, I'm, I'm unhappy. Look at verse eight, look at Job 18. You who tear yourself in anger. Will that cause the earth to be abandoned? Will it make rocks fall from a cliff? Uh, in, in, what's, what is this saying right here? This is saying that you are tearing yourself up. And who's getting hurt in this? You is. Am I right? You're tearing yourself. You're the only one getting hurt in all of this thing. You know what this is saying? Resentment is dumb. That's what it's saying. Resentment is ridiculous. Why? Because when you are full of resentment, it monopolizes your attention. And you can't think about anything else but that resentment. It, is that any fun? Is it fun to be tormented by uh, sleepless nights and wasted days? Plotting and thinking about how I'm going to get back at somebody and what I'm going to say? They're having a great time floating down the road, and you're the one that's miserable. You're hurting yourself and tearing yourself up. So how can we be a peacemaker? What would it mean to be a peacemaker? How could I know I'm reflecting my father's image? Well, let me give you five ways real quick, all right? Five ways, and I'm going to use an acrostic. I'm going to use a, like a, like a, this is going to be kind of like a little puzzle. It's a little word. We're going to use the word peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. And, and we're going to let the P and, the, and then E and A, and, and this is going to help us remember this, hopefully. All right. Uh, hopefully that's what this will do. Number, uh oh, I've already gone to it. Number one, the P is plan a peace conference. Now, remember, we're talking about being a peacemaker, right? So it means we have to take an initiative, right? Means we have to do something, right? Means we 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 we're first to, to to do something that hopefully will make a difference in this fellowship part of there. And I'm just saying the first thing that you do is you gotta you gotta plan a peace conference. Now I'm gonna give you a passage. We've already read this, but I'm gonna read it one more time so we'll see it. Therefore, now I'm gonna emphasize some words. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar. And you get to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you. I mean, it doesn't say you get there and you remember you have something against them. It's that they have something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, I, I just want to ask the question, uh, who has the initiative here? Well, both the offender and the offended, it, it's always my move, right? <laughs> I mean, I get there, and if I've got something against you, then, okay, i got to leave my gift and go be reconciled. But it, 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 go, it doesn't say that. It says, if I get down to the altar and I remember that you have something against me, <laughs> right? I could be the offended myself. But anyway, I just want you to say, see that what God says is whether I'm the offender or the offended, it's always my move. How many of you remember 1976? Who was president of the United States? Who got elected president in 1976? I'm old. Jimmy Carter. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Carter, the Georgia governor, peanut farmer, 
from Georgia, got elected governor, I mean, got elected president from 1977, actually took office to, to 81. Well, somewhere before 1979, I can't remember the exact date, but there was a, he set up a conference at a, at a camp, at a military camp in the United States called Camp David. And he brought in at Camp David Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, and Menachem Begin, the president of Israel, and, and, and Jimmy Carter, and Menachem Begin, and Anwar Sadat met at a peace conference at a camp from the Prince of Peace, King David. It's just amazing, the symbolism here. And talked peace and made peace. And, and listen to this. For the first time in the history of the world, for the first time that since there was an Israel and there was an Egypt, they've always been at war with each other. Anytime anybody attacked Israel, you could just say it, Egypt's jumping in because Egypt's just looking for a reason to attack Israel. But because of that peace conference, because Carter set it up and made it happen and pushed it through for the first time ever, they were at peace with each other. They said, we're not going to attack you. We're not going to keep on being at, at, at odds with you. We're going to be at peace, and, and, and we're not gonna, you, you can rest easy about this. And for that, Anwar Sadat won the Nobel Peace Prize for taking the initiative to go into Israel and, 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 and to walk in places and open places and and actively take charge and be a peacemaker. For that, he was killed. In 1991, he was shot by Muslim extremists while he was viewing a parade in Egypt uh, honoring the Yom Kippur Wars. He was just a spectator, and they came in and just shot him all to pieces. So being a peacemaker is not an easy thing, and I'm, I'm just saying that if you're going to be a peacemaker, you're going to have to uh, have to take the initiative. And I know you might be asking, well, why should I go to them? Because they hurt me. I, I mean, they, they're the ones that violated me. Well, one real good reason is because uh, Jesus said so. <laughs> How about that? You want to be right with him? So you, for, you go first, you schedule a meeting, you sit down, you actively seek to reconcile because conflict never settles itself. So when am I supposed to go? I'm supposed to go first. I'm supposed to go while we're right in the middle of the, yeah, yeah. You know, we're, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not supposed to let this thing brew and do that because the longer it, the longer it rattles, the worse it gets. And so I plan a peace conference and you say, what would motivate me to do that? Well, here, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, who's going to make the first move? Whoever's closest to Jesus is basically what it's going to be. Now, let me give you another. This is another aspect of being a peacemaker. You say, I want to look like my father. So if you want to look like your father, all right, I'm just saying, all right, start by planning a peace conference. And then second, empathize with their feelings. By empathize, I mean try to put yourself in their shoes. Did you know that many things in life would be solved if you would just think this way? Put yourself where they are as much as possible now. I know you can't totally do this. But think about how, why they are the way they are. And you'll find out, what you'll find out is that, that hurting people hurt people that many times they hurt people because they themselves are really hurting in life. Look at Philippians uh, 2, verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. What does that mean? It means pay attention to the needs of others. When you're upset, who are you thinking about? When you're upset, you know who you're thinking about? You. And only you. And what you need and what you think and how you feel and how you've been offended. My feelings, you hurt me and I'm, 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 I'm offended in this. You know what God says? God says reverse that. God says think about what they need. Think about what he needs or she needs in life. Parents, you do this all the time. I, 
mean, this is what you do daily in life. These tug of wars with your children. Yeah, they come in there and they ain't got a, you know, one's pulling one way and one's pulling the other way. Ma, he did this and she did that. And what are you? You jump in there and you just kind of separate. You say, all right, now what happened here? And you hear this one and you hear this one. And then, you know, you, 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 you hear what they're saying. You know what they're feeling. You, you're, you're, you're emotionally involved and intimately involved. And then you make a decision and you separate things and you say, all right, here's you. And this is what you're going to do. And here's you. And this is what you're going to do. I mean, you do that all the time in your family, probably every day if you have... If you have children, because they're always selfish and self-centered and all of that kind of stuff. But that's what we're talking about. Of course, one of the upsides of conflict is once it's resolved, you usually have a lot more intimacy with somebody else because now you understand them a little bit better. So plan a peace conference and then empathize with their feelings. And then the A, P-E-A, the A is attack the problem, not the person. Now, this is really critical because if you go into a peace conference for the purpose of attacking the person, then you're wasting your time because it's not the person that you want to have corrected. It's the problem. If you can't focus on fixing the problem, then you're wasting your time. I mean, you can't fix the problem and fix the blame at the same time. Look at what Proverbs 15 says. A gentle answer. You know what that means? An appropriate answer. It means an, it means an answer that is not harsh. An answer that is not abusive. Foul is what it means. A gentle answer. An appropriate answer turns away wrath. But harsh words, and you know just the ones to say. Harsh words stir it up. Now, that's God's way of saying that we need to engage our minds before we engage our mouths. That we, need to, that we need to think about what we're saying and how we're saying. Did you know that 65% of communication is nonverbal? 65% of what people receive from you in communication doesn't come out of their mouth. It's your body language. Have you, ever, have you ever said to your mate when you get a little offended, it's not what you say, it's the way you said it, right? Well, what, how did that happen? Well, your countenance, uh, your demeanor, your, 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 your body language, uh, right? Your sarcasm, the tone of your voice, the rolling of your eyes. All of that kind of stuff attacks the person. It speaks to the person. It, 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 you, you do it many times without even thinking about it, and it just reflects a, a, a contempt for someone else. And if you're trying to make peace with somebody, you can't be sending out signals that say, I'd love to just pop you right outside of here. <laughs> you can't be sending <laughs> signals that say, you are the biggest, well, no. You, you know, that's going to come across is what I'm saying to you. And, and see, Ephesians 4 says, let no communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of building up. That means, uh, uh, like before, not foul. It means not abusive, not uh, uh, sarcastic. And it means just good communication that's good for building up, that it may minister grace into the, into the hearers. That just means don't let anything foul or abusive or critical or harsh or ugly or devilish come out of your mouth, but only let things come out of your mouth that are encouraging toward the other. That's good advice, but it's very difficult to do when you're out of fellowship with somebody. Not that I know anything about that, but I'm just supposing here, all right? So we, we don't jump in and criticize and condemn and blame and accuse. You're just like your father. No, you're just like your first wife. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> That's attacking the person and not the problem. And you know what's happening to the problem? The problem's standing in the corner laughing at both of you. 
getting bigger. That's right, Ken. Getting bigger. That's what the problem's doing. You're, you're making it worse. You're not making it better. So you got to attack the problem, not the person. All right, so we plan a peace conference. We empathize with their feelings. We attack the problem, not the person. And then here's the C, cooperate as much as possible. Be a bridge builder rather than a bridge wrecker. Do you know you're going to have to cross over a bridge to get where you're going? If you burn that bridge down, you're burning the very bridge that you're going to need to cross over and get up toward God. I mean, you, you guys have done this. You understand this, right? I mean, you don't do this at work, right? I mean, if, if you do, you don't, you don't get promoted. I mean, they don't consider you to be, you know, management or whatever because you can't control yourself. You can't cooperate with other people. As a matter of fact, Jesus said one of the greatest reflections that you belong to God is that somehow you can get along with difficult people. That's part of being your Christian life. So when we, when, when we go in with a spirit of compromise, and I know we Christians, when you say the word compromise, you, it's almost like a, a cuss word to us. Because we think, man, well, I'm a compromise, a compromiser. Me, me. You think it's weakness or something. Do you know, uh, compromise is good it, 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 given the right circumstances. You know, because you know what the spirit of compromise is? It's just going in and saying, all right, what can we agree on? That's what it is. All right, I know we got a bunch of stuff that we don't agree on, but what is it that we can agree on? Remember Romans 12, where the apostle Paul says, uh, uh, as much as it depends on you, I mean, if possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying, the distinguishing mark of you as a Christian ought to be your ability to get along with other people. It's not how much you give or how much you sing or how much you preach or teach. It, it is, do, do you play well with others? How many of you have gotten a report card from school with your child with a little box mark, does not play well with others? <laughs> right? All right, if God marked your, mark, marked your card... Would he mark on your card, uh, this is good, satisfactory, satisfactory. Uh, play well with others, uh, negatory, that's fail. That's the distinguishing mark of a Christian. And, and, and so Jesus said in John 13, by this shall they know that you are my disciples. What is the next line? If you love one another. Right? So if we, can, if we can love difficult people and get along with difficult people, that is, that is a mark of Christ living inside our life. But it's not going to always be possible because he said, if, it, if you possibly can, so don't get me wrong, I know some people are just ridiculous and there's just no way to do things, but, it, it, but we're not talking about those exceptions. We're talking about in life in general, the stuff we can Take control of peace has a price. Your ego, your, your you know, your 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 pride. Uh, that that that's the that's the price of, of being a peacemaker. I mean, you might have to think something like this. You know, my wife might be right. What a horrible thought, right? <laughs> my husband might be right. You know. I don't, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. You might have to say the two most difficult world, words in the world. You know what they are? I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> are the three diff most difficult uh, words. I, I was wrong. Are the five most difficult words. I'm sorry I was wrong. <laughs> are the six most difficult words. I'm sorry I was wrong a lot. Well, that might be seven. Because A and lot. Anyway, how far could we go and all that? Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that, that, that peace has a price and that it costs us something to be a peacemaker and to take the initiative. Uh, back in the early 70s, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm so old and I don't know anything about life now, and I have to use all these references back to when I was young, when I can remember what stuff was current back then. But you'll just have to follow me. I think you can follow this. There was a movie, there was a book written by Eric Siegel, 
in about 1970, the book was called Love Story. Love Story was made into a movie that became an award-winning movie. And it had a famous line in it that was quoted extensively. And I know if you've got all these networks, you've probably watched Love Story many times by now, if, they, if you were interested. It was, it was real big back then, and the line was just one of those lines that nobody could forget. And you, when I say it, you'll say, oh, yeah. The line in the movie that was, uh, that was repeated over and over and over was, love means never having to say you're sorry. Yeah, that sounds good. The only thing is, it's dead wrong. <laughs> love means you having to say you're sorry a lot. You know why? Because you hurt people. And you get hurt a lot. So, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we have, to, we have to deal with. And in relationships, we hurt people and they hurt us. And love means I got to do this a lot, you know. James said, I think, let me see if I have it. Yeah, here it is. The fruit of, the right, the fruit of righteousness. Righteousness just means being right. The fruit of being right is sown in peace by them that make peace. This is just simply saying, be careful because you reap what you sow. If you sow peace, you reap peace. If you sow bitterness, you get bitterness. If you sow griping and complaining and belly aching and accusing, and guess what you're going to reap? You're going to reap what you sow. That is what the Bible said. Be not deceived. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. For God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. How much clearer could God be than that? Watch what you say. Watch what you do. Watch your attitude. Watch your disposition. Because you're, going, you're reaping a crop based on what you've sown out there in the world. And that doesn't just mean money. That means anything we sow in life. So I plan a peace conference, empathize with them if, uh, as much as possible, attack the problem, not the person, and then I cooperate as much as possible. I go in saying, what is it we agree on? And then let me give you the last one here. Emphasize reconciliation, not resolution. This is a big deal right here. Reconciliation and resolution are, um, uh, are relationship words. They're, they're conflict resolution words. So the, you may not use them very often, but let me just tell you, there's a big difference, a big difference between reconciliation and resolution. Reconciliation means uh, I restore the relationship. Now, I, I know that may not ding any bells for you. That, that may not be sexy, but let me tell you what that means. What that means is that if we have to fix the problem, we may never fix the problem. Because sometimes the problem is the problem and, no, and you can't fix it. You are so divergent, you are so separated, you, you, you are so uh, out with it, you know, that it cannot be fixed. You cannot resolve it. You just have to choose to reconcile, which means in spite of the differences we have, we're going to have a relationship. We're not going to be on the outs with each other in our relationship because there's too many negative consequences of that. So what we're going to have to do is, in spite of the fact that we didn't fix this problem, we're going we're to live with it and we're going to focus on reestablishing the relationship, not having to fix the problem. Uh, I just finished uh, th this past Sunday night a series for about, I think we were three or four weeks in it. It was called Not Wrong, Just Different. And it's about husbands and wives, men and women, and the differences they have. A lot of differences, right? Big ones, right? Big ones. I, like, like we're opposite, not, not just, you know, we kind of go and look. Uh, no, I mean, we, we're opposite. God created us that way on purpose, by the way. But anyway, I won't preach that. But I do want to use an example to show you what I mean about, about resolution and reconciliation. And that there are some problems that you can't fix. So if you're trying to resolve it, you, are, you can hang it up because it ain't happening. It's just too different. I mean, too, you know, uh -uh. Uh, men and women are different, right? Well, do you know that uh, according to the uh, statistics, 
that women have the capacity to speak 25,000 words a day. Men have the capacity to speak 12,000 words a day. That doesn't surprise you, does it? No, women are lots more verbal than we are, right? They like the fine print, we're the headlines. They say, how are you? We give you, we give you the six second version, fine. <laughs> and we think we've explained everything with that one word, fine. That's a headline, no, give me some details. Uh, you know, fine print. But, yeah. Well, because women have a 25,000 word capacity and men only have a 12,000 word capacity, we're different. When you ladies get offended because you say, my husband's not listening to me. He just doesn't listen to what I say. I'm just going to tell you that the, re the reason you think that, it, it's, it's not his fault, okay? Hey, come on, you guys, help me out. It, it's not his fault. The reason why you hear that, it, it, <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> what it is is, what it is is, what it is is that men have a, a twelve to 15,000 word capacity in our brain. Th that means we only have space for twelve to 15,000 words up here. You, ha you can speak 25,000. So once, once you get... Once we get twelve to 15,000 words up here, we don't have any more storage space for that, for that other 12,000 words that you've been talking about. So they just fly right over our head because our brain does not have the possibility of that kind of capacity to, to hold words in life. And I know that sounds silly and ridiculous, but, but, that, but do you get the point, right? The point is that sometimes there are just things that we have to live with because we're not going to change them. I mean, it's not going to happen. So reconciliation means you bury the hatchet and not in their back either, all right? You say, I'd like to bury a hatchet, all right? I'm bury it right there up to their room. Bur to be reconciled means that we, that, we, that, we, uh, that we bury the hatchet, not the issue. I mean, we can still talk about the issue. We can still discuss the issue. But... But we, we, we discuss it now in some kind of harmony. I mean, some kind of reconciliated harmony. Like we're on the same team, wanting the same thing, going in the same direction. And it means we can discuss this. We can disagree without being disagreeable. And I know that's a well overused line, and it sounds silly. But you, I think everybody in here understands what I'm saying because, I mean... If you're going at stuff and you are mad and angry and, and no matter what they say or do, it's not going to please you. You're not going to settle anything at all. So if we focus on reconciliation, reestablishing the relationship, rather than resolution fixing the problem, then at least we have uh, two people going in the same direction attacking the same problem at the same time, or when I focus on the relationship, all of a sudden the issue is, is not all that big of a deal anymore. Or we get the thing resolved. So the, the benefits is, you know, if I, if I focus on reconciliation, then I've at least got a chance. So emphasize reconciliation, not resolution. Let me give you one more little verse, and I'm quitting, I promise all things are of God, this is 2 Corinthians 5. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Do you see what word it uses? We, we've been reconciled, uh, not resolved. You know why? Because we're still sinners. We live in a fallen world. We're a fallen race. We're a fallen people, and we're going to still have problems, and we're going to still sin. Even though our soul is saved, we're still going to have problems with sin because we're sinners by nature. That's why we need a Savior. That's why the grace of God and the mercy of God cover us because we're still going to mess up. So we can't be resolved, but we can be reconciled. Reconciled means to reestablish a relationship. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God sent Jesus 
to reconcile us to himself, to bring us to peace with God. And when you help others come to reconciliation, then you reflect the image of your father. You're just like dad. When people look at you, you're a chip off the old block. Maybe you're just like dad. When you become what? A peacemaker. Who can be a peacemaker? Anybody who has peace in them, <laughs> right? If Jesus has saved your soul and given you peace, you can be a peacemaker. You don't have to be a professional at this. You don't have to be a preacher or a counselor or somebody like that. And peacemaking. Take advantage of that, you know? That's, a, that's the nature of God. So happy are the peacemakers because they reflect the image of dad. And the world sees Jesus when they see peacemakers. All right.